Okay, so last time we were together, we put together a list. And this list came from God's Word, though I believe all of us, all of us were involved as we participated in putting together this list. This list of 10 to 12 truths, and there are many more, the question was asked, when we think about what Jesus talked when he said there will be the beginning of many sorrows, the birth pains that Jesus communicated to us, his followers, he talked about how we're to live a life of preparedness. And today that's what we're going to go into. I thought it, uh, that we would take this list, and I want to just enumerate them as we talked about them last time, and refresh our hearts and minds. And then I want us to look at Matthew, the 25th chapter. But before we do that, I want us to look at this list. And the first number, number one, is a good place to start. Number one said, who am I going to be in this world? And that was in reference to the scripture, for it says that we are to be soul winners. And in the world, we are to share the gospel, to live the gospel, to love the gospel. And we are to freely give as we have freely received. By the grace of God, we have been saved, and we are called to be God's ambassadors in this world. We are His fellow workers, and as we see the end draw nigh, we are to be active. We are to be participating in soul winning. So, number one, who am I to be in this world? Number two, He is the saving grace. He is my saving grace. As we go through this trials and temptations in this world, in every generation, He is my saving grace. Number three, we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, looking for His mercy. When Jesus comes again, we should be ready. We should not be surprised, but our eyes should be fixed. Our hearts should be fixed on the coming of the Lord. Number four, we are to build each other up. That is so important for us as Christians. As we see the day approaching, the day of Jesus Christ, the day of His coming, we are to be building one another up, edifying the house of God. We are not to come in and tear each other down, but we are to build one another up by encouraging one another in our faith. How important it is when we see someone struggling not to take advantage and criticize them for their failure, but that is a time they need to hear encouraging words and actions the most. Number five, number five prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit. We're to be praying not only for ourselves, but for our families, for the church of God. He is the Lord of the harvest. He said to pray to me, and I'd send forth laborers. So we are to be praying for one another as we see the day approaching. God, prepare me every day that I would be in the world as Jesus was in the world. We are not to be of the world, but we are in the world. There's a big difference. The world's not to shape us. We're not to be conformed to the image of the world, but we are to be conformed to the image that is to the behavior and character of Jesus Christ. And so we are to every day be in prayer, asking God that He's going to make us who we need to be. And then I'm going to turn the board. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Let's see if it'll flip over, of course, and I won't. Wow. There we go. And it's going to flip over. So I'm not sure. Let's see this. And then the list continues on the back side of the board. How important it is that the Word of Christ dwells in our hearts richly. The Word of God should dwell in our hearts richly as we examine Colossians, the third chapter. That was your homework for today. Hopefully everyone read that scripture because many of these points come from Colossians chapter 3 because it teaches us as we look to our heavenly calling, it talks about how we are to live and to prepare for the coming of Jesus. We prepare for His coming by letting the Word of God dwell in our hearts richly. Then, we are to be thankful and praising God at all times. The list continues. We are to do everything wholeheartedly. How important it is, as we see the day approaching, that we take every initiative, that we give God our very best, that we place Him as our top priority in life, to please Him by living by faith. And then finally, our reward, which speaks of judgment. The church is going to be judged. You as a Christian, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged depending on how you handle the grace that was given to you. God has saved you through circumstances in life. He has certainly me. 
He has saved all of us. Every person here to a degree can speak of God's grace. How mightily God's grace has been in your life. For that reason, we're gathered here this morning. We're going to have a baptism today. It testifies to the grace of God. God has freely given you His grace, and we will be judged as Christians. What did you do effectively with the grace that was given you? These are those items that we talked about, spiritual truths about how we are to prepare for His coming. Now, a lot of scripture I didn't talk about, of which I think are certainly scriptures that we can look at. For example, in Revelation chapter 8, there are a list of interesting prophetical visions given by Jesus. And if you'll look at Revelation, the 8th chapter, You'll read about some interesting um, future events that God gave us. For example, there is going to be many cataclysmic events in the universe around us. Now, that could be symbolically spoken of. There's spoke there. What it refers to is a great star that falls to the earth. Another is a great burning mountain. That is a vision of John that's given to him. And it's called Wormwood. Wormwood is a term used of a plant that had a very bitter taste. And it speaks of the bitterness that's going to come upon the waters, a third of the waters of the earth, and how many people's lives are going to be devastated by these cataclysmic events. And you can read about those seals that are unbroken, seals that are revealed to John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. We didn't even read Revelation chapter 8. But it coincides with what Jesus said. He said, you're going to see in the stars and the heavens. You're going to see events. You're going to see life-changing, cataclysmic events that's going to be seen in the heavens above. You can see recently all kinds of news. If you're, And I don't talk about things that are made up, but you can see more and more as you study in the news and the headlines uh, as people are gazing out into the stars, they talk about how these asteroids and meteors are coming closer and closer as we have the technology to view the heavens. And they see all these great mountainous type rocks that are coming by the earth. And it is speculation on when that day might happen when one of those mighty meteors or asteroids will strike the earth. Well, it's certainly not beyond what science is showing, but God's Word teaches in the book of Revelation chapter 8 that there are going to be signs in the heavens. And John the Revelator said that he saw, as it was, a great mountain on fire coming out of the stars and striking the earth. And immediately after that, darkness is going to be on the earth. And that follows exactly what science would say. If actually there would be, or some would interpret that saying, well, it's speaking of some kind of nuclear war that's going to take place. Well, I'm not going to sit here and try to say who's right or wrong. God's Word is right, and we'll know more and more day by day as we walk with God. But I, I believe in my heart it's speaking of cataclysmic events that's going to happen. And what's going to take place when I believe what would be a meteor or some type of great rock that strikes the earth would be the amount of dust and pollution and dirt that would then immediately rise and filter into the atmosphere and block the sunlight. That's happened before, and I think that is exactly what God's Word is teaching. So there's many things that we didn't talk about in our studies. But what I want to focus on today is what Jesus said as he, as he summed up the beginning of sorrows, as He talked about the signs of the end of the age, He gave two stories. He actually gave three. We're going to focus on two. He says, I want to share three stories with you to illustrate who you are to be in this world. The first of which is a parable about a wedding. And so I want to read that, and I want you to focus with me. It's found in Matthew. And so if you turn to the 25th chapter... Let's read that together. So verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. 
Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, And surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This scripture is a parable. It is an earthly story that has a heavenly message. Here God uses the text to illustrate how we are to prepare for the coming of Jesus. Certainly there are striking messages that are given here. Number one, that is, we should not be asleep. We should not be asleep. Here's what the scripture says in verse 5. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. There's danger in sleeping and slumbering. We talked about how we are to encourage one another. Remember, that was one of our points. That means we assemble together. That's the importance. When we say we're getting together for church, one of the actions of the church is to keep the fire alive, to keep it burning. The church must keep one another, us as Christians, we got to keep the fire burning, the excitement. This is more than a social gathering. I enjoy getting together. And we've had some good times. We've gathered at restaurants. We've had food and breakfast. And we'll continue to do those things by the grace of God. But the church is to be actively burning a fire. That is a spiritual fire. And that is we are to get together. And as we praise God and study His Word, we ought to generate excitement between us that Jesus is coming again. And we need to be excited. We need to be actively serving. We need to be looking for His return. And so as Christians, we are to be involved, not asleep, but we need to be involved always in action. Samantha gave me a, one of those deaths. They, came, they gained a lot of popularity through the years, but she gave me one years ago. And it's one of those desks that you, squit, you you punch in these buttons, I forget how it works, and then it raises up so that you don't have to sit at a desk in front of your computer. You can stand in front of your computer. Well, I'm not staying in front of a computer all day, but the last thing I want to do at work is come in and sit down. I've always hated that because when I sit down, bad things happen. I start getting nosy, right? Get behind the wheel of a car, I'll never forget when I bought my Buick and the guy said to me, you know what, this car has one of the quiet cabins you'll ever be in driving. I said, really? He said, oh, you won't hear any road noise? I tell you what, this car will put you right to sleep. He was right. Yeah, yeah I went right to sleep driving that car and took it 80 miles an hour and hit a guardrail and flipped it down the interstate. And I, I had to call and tell him, you know what, when you told me this car put you to sleep, you're right on. You said it had 12 airbags or something like that. It does. Thank God for those airbags. I bounced around inside that balloon all that time. Well, I joke just to kind of wake us up is that there's danger in sleeping. Christians, we sometimes go to sleep when all this is is a social event. We lose the heart of soul winning. We lose the heart of living for God. When sin when sin becomes something that no longer bothers us inside. You know, as Christians, there's a lot of talk anymore how we live in a society and people say, I'm so proud of how society is changing. You can just be anybody you want to be. You can decide on your lifestyle. You can choose this lifestyle, that lifestyle. And more and more, it puts the focus on the Christian message because we, as God's people, we are not preaching you can just live any lifestyle you want. Because Jesus came to give us one way, and that's to live the way of righteousness. And that's not the Baptist way, it's not the Catholic or Protestant way, it's God's way. You see, as a young boy or a young woman, as you grow in years, God's Word is to be respected and loved. 
And therefore, when I read God's Word, it should be a mirror to me. And as I'm looking at God's Word, it is a mirror to me and it should shape my life. And I, as I look in the mirror, that is God's Word, and say, you know what? God's Word's teaching me I should live like this. But I'm not living that way. Now, I have an option, right? I could say, well, I was born differently, and so I'm going to live my life my own way, my own lifestyle. I'll dress, act, behave the way I want. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean your way is the right way. The Bible actually says there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it's destruction. God's Word teaches me that Jesus came and He said, I'm going to give you one way. He said, I am the way. His Word does not compromise God's righteousness. His Word, His Ten Commandments, and all of His Word in its entirety teaches me how I should live. It's not just about the things I shouldn't do, but God's Word teaches me what I should be doing as I follow Jesus. His Word shapes my life. Therefore, I should not be asleep at the wheel, but I should be awake and excited because God's Word should be shaping my life and I should be actively becoming closer and closer to God. We as Christians, we fall asleep. We fall asleep. I'm excited today. We've got water in the baptistry. Now that water doesn't mean anything unless it represents changed lives. How thankful I was as God moved in all of your lives. But just the other day when Hobart met the altar of God, it inspired me and inspires all of us because he is an evidence. I'm using him as an example. I could speak of Candace. I could speak of that. I could speak of all of us here today. All of us. Is that when a person is at the altar of God and they're sincere, humble before the Lord, seeking God's direction, seeking a new start with God. It inspires all of us and it should wake us up because that is the reason the lights are on this church and that's the reason we're gathering here today is to see people's lives change, to see people saved by the proclamation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior. We are to be excited, not asleep. This is something that Jesus warned he says, you see the day approaching, don't be asleep. Because sometimes people forget or they fail to remember what's going to happen. We can't forget, we should never lose hope that Jesus Christ is going to come and He's going to return when God sees it's the right time. Until that day, we're to live life daily expecting His return. I won't be prepared unless I see Jesus coming every day. I'll go to sleep. I'll lose the excitement. My life will start falling into a stagnant spiritual decay. That's not what God wants us to be. We ought to be a people alive. When we get upstairs and sing songs, it should come from the heart. We shouldn't have to get up there and say, Hey, everybody, I need you to sing right now. We, including myself, it should be a natural response of love and excitement as we see the day coming. We ought to get our hymn books and get our songs of praise books open and say, Lord, I'm singing praise to you today. I'm excited. I'm excited that you included me. I don't want to be asleep. I don't want to waste the grace that you've given me. That's what Jesus said. But here the illustration is that many of these now, let's put this together real quick. Because the oriental wedding of that day that Jesus spoke is different than our weddings. And we have days, let's say it's Saturday and we're going to have a wedding at 2 o'clock. Allie, uh, my daughter Allie, got to see her. It was a pleasant trip to see her this weekend. She came in Friday and we got together with her. And that was enjoyable. She turned 25. My little baby's growing up. Oh, it breaks my heart. I don't want to think about it. Yeah. Anyway, she's too growing up. And, uh, and this little guy here, now he uh, picks me up and I'm worried he's going to break me at any time. Well, our kids grow up and time moves on, but I had an enjoyable, we did as a family, we had, had a, a little bit of a birthday get together. And she turned 25 and we had some laughs and enjoyed our time. But uh, where was I going to go with this? Uh, anybody help me out while the tape's rolling? I was getting to a point here. What were we talking about? Anybody help me out? Were you paying attention? Yep. The weddings. The, the weddings. Wedding. Weddings are different. So Allie had a wedding, and we went to that 
that wedding. It was at a nearby park. It was on a specific time designated on a specific day. And we went to a local park and they had a gazebo setting and we enjoyed that day. Well, the Oriental wedding that Jesus describes here is a little bit different. Now, they had a time, a day given that there's going to be a wedding on October 24th. Uh, but here's the idea. The bridesmaid with the bride would go to one location, a part of the city, and no one really knew when it was going to happen. There was a place designated. There was a place that had been designated for the wedding and the reception. And, the, and the, what would happen is, is at a point only the groom knew. The groom, he and his helpers, the, the groomsmen, at a specific time that he only knew that he chose, he would leave his house and then he would lead a procession of, like a parade going through the city. And then there would be shouting and excitement and announcement saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then it was up to the bridesmaids to have these poles with like cloth dipped in oil. They had to be ready because at midnight, at a time that they weren't really expecting, they would have to light their wick and get it all ready to go. And then they would come together, the two parties, the groom and the bride and the helpers, they'd all get together and they'd go off to the designated place for the wedding. See, it's a lot different, the excitement and the unexpectancy. I kind of like that. You know, it's like I have a Christmas morning, right? You're just like, when, when's mom and dad going to get up? I don't know. I'm, Maybe if I go loud and drop a glass and break it, they'll get up, right? But here's the Oriental wedding. Only the groom knew. And that's how it is as the Christian walk with God. Only God knows. That's what Jesus said. You don't know when the hour's coming. You don't know when that moment's coming. It's like the midnight cry. And suddenly there's going to be, at that point, God's going to give Jesus Christ his son, he's going to give him the authority and the right time to come. And we, we are those who are considered the virgins, the bridesmaids. We're to be ready at all times. Have our poles, our spiritual life, we're to be ready to go. So that when we hear that announcement, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. We're ready to meet him and we won't be ashamed. How it is at work sometimes, and I maybe have made that mistake, Sometimes people, I've seen people come into work and they're wearing pajamas, their hair is all over, that you can just see they just rolled out of bed, put on a pair of shoes, and came into work. Well, I can't do that, right? I, I've got to get up, I've got to get a little, my blood flowing, I've got to get in a shower, and I've got to get some kind of clothes on. I've got to look decent, and I've got to be awake. If I'm going to do my job, I've got to be awake, and there's got to be some point in time I get up and I get ready. Well, we as Christians... We need to get up. We need to be awake. We need to be excited. We need to be living as God called us to live. So that when that announcement comes, He's coming. He's coming. We're not caught in an embarrassed situation. Many Christians will be caught in an embarrassed situation. Not living for God. Not putting God first. Or we'll be, we'll be asleep. We'll say, who's coming? Oh, I never thought He'd come. Well, I read that story in the Bible, and that like Noah, I mean, it happened long ago, and Jesus, he, he came 2,000 years ago. That's maybe not what we say with our lips, because we're afraid to, I'm afraid to say something like that. But that's how we live, right? That's how we live sometimes. We live as though we're asleep. I know I do. And if Jesus was to come sometimes, I'd be like, who's coming? Oh my goodness, I'm not ready, right? I'm not ready. And that's the whole point of this parable that Jesus gave. Seeing that we're living during the beginning of sorrows, we ought to pay attention to this story that Jesus gave. Let us not be asleep or indifferent, but let's be excited and let's be living in a way that when God says to Jesus, it's time to go, we as His people are saying, Lord, I've been standing ready. I've been active. I've been waiting for Your return. And let's get together and go home. That's the point of what Jesus was saying. So there's another parable next week we're going to talk about. It's the parable of the talents. And we want to be here for that as well. So we're going to go upstairs at this point. God